Thank you so much. Um, if commerce and creativity are important in our world today, there are very few people uh, of a comparable level of achievement as the person with whom I'm about to have a dialogue, Gary Shapiro. He helped grow the Consumer Technology Association's incredible conference, which we'll be talking about, called CES, which is the, probably the largest trade and uh, innovation generator on a regular basis on the planet today. Because so much of our lives are governed by technological innovation. He's an author, soccer dad with four sons. Um, he's lived sort of at the intersection of law. He's a graduate of Georgetown Law School. Technology, societal innovation, trade, international relations. Um, I did. A, I looked at. I looked at Wikipedia, and he has 31 awards. Awards for top lobbyists, awards for most influential uh, creative thinkers, just so many awards, and well deserved. I have been uh, privileged to be a participant in the last um, conference that he chaired in, La in Las Vegas, and we'll be talking about something that I just want to highlight and emphasize and underscore and put an exclamation point after it, which is he highlighted human security as the theme. The technology should not only be uh, a generator of wealth and improving our lives, but it also should be improving the sustainability of the human's relationship to the natural world. The technology should be addressing health, safety, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from indignity, human security. And he made that part of the DNA of a gathering of over 100,000 participants, a third of whom came from other countries. Uh, there was, within the conference, there was a mini conference of Google that had 10,000 people. So we have, as our guest today, someone who created that forum in which so many ideas and interactions can generate the synergy that the human community can achieve when people get together. Gary, please join us. the restaurant there. Guy Lombardo would perform every night. Does anyone know who Guy Lombardo is? Thank you. I got to know Guy Lombardo. He told me that I could not do, I used to manage it and everyone was seated, a thousand people a night. His band would be playing and I would get bored so I would dance. I'd ask women to dance and I was pretty good at it. I thought he came up to me afterwards and said, Gary, give it up. You can't do the three-step polka, the beer barrel polka, which my Polish friends would know what that one is. So, go ahead. There must have been some powerful influences that gave you the confidence to be so creative in, a, in an area in which that level of creativity is so rare. Um, corporate, cor corporations doing technology and all. Where you, you have, you have cre I've looked at your career and you, CTA was a, was a small, influential, but nothing like it is today before you came. But today, it's a powerhouse. So it took a lot of confidence to do that. Where did that come from? It well, also took a lot of luck. I mean, I didn't invent anything. There was companies that got into technology. When I started, there was three products. You know, radios, TVs, well, phonographs, 
I think that's pretty much it. Um, the VCR came along, the CD player came along. The, I remember in 1982, the, the PC, I was working with IBM to make October computer, computer learning money and got Congress to pass a resolution on that. I, mean, they, they, I, I hitched my sled to a rising wagon that, and I actually, I, I see a lot of your law firms, or most of you, uh, I was working for a large law firm and the association was my client. Uh, but you asked me how I got, so I actually made a decision to leave the law firm. But in terms of how I got the confidence, which goes back to my roots, I have no clue. I'll, I'll credit my parents, because I have three brothers, we're all very different, and I have four sons, as you mentioned. And I'd say, I'd say that's eight of us. Um, and we all have this high degree of self-confidence and where we think we know how to run everything, which means, we don't get along that well, because we're all trying to be in charge. Well, type A, I'm sure some of you have siblings like that. I don't, I'm, I'm the only child. <laughs> <laughs> I had the issue of, you know, uh, uh, being told I was special. And you are special. And now, <laughs> isn't he special? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, in order to do a conference that brought over 5,000 media people, over 3,200 exhibitors, a third of whom were from outside of the United States, um, and uh, basically the top players in the field of technological innovation that has created the Anthropocene, the period of human history in which we live, in which the evolution of the planet is being impacted by technology and human influence, unlike ever before, to bring all those people together, to coordinate that, and for them to trust you, because you had to deal with, deal with a lot of very big elephants to get them to dance together, that not only takes a lot of confidence, that takes a lot of social skills. And um, I just wanted to honor that, you know, about, about you, and I wanted to ask how you tell the evolution Describe the CTA and the CES for the audience with greater depth than I have and the evolution of it. So we're celebrating our 100th year next year. And we started out in 1924 here as the Radio Manufacturers Association. And it was radio. People made radios. It was the same time around the broadcasters started our association, National Association of Broadcasters. We actually shared an office. I know I don't look that old, but that's all true, I'm told. Um, but it became radio and television, and then, and then I, um, when I was a law student at Georgetown, I, I got there, I needed money, like right away, just to eat, and I, the first day at the law school, I went to the job placement office, and I got a job on Capitol Hill, and it, you know, usually in Washington, people have these great strategies of their career, I just needed money, and I, I was very happy to make whatever it was, 10 bucks an hour or something like that, working in a congressional office. Um, and I was lucky enough that the congressman I worked for actually uh, had a um, former FBI agent and lawyer um, thought out that our administrative machinery wasn't run right and he wanted to redo the Administrative Procedures Act. So I immersed myself in that and helped him draft it, um, which worked out. And that got me a job in a law firm, which ended up becoming Squire Sanders, which has now changed names and merged and a whole bunch of other firms. But the client that I worked with, I was working with a, for a, uh, my mentor at the time, the former cabinet secretary and the president candidate, Ed Day, who invented the zip code. Um, and he also wrote a book on public speaking, and he taught me early on that if you're going to a client's luncheon or event, you better ask a question and introduce yourself to the speaker and the audience, because that's what you're here for. Um, so that started that out pretty early, but the client I had was the association, and we started, I started investigating something when there was a lawsuit was brought uh, against the legality of the VCR, the video cassette recorder, by Hollywood. And that led, one thing led to another very quickly, and by the age of 26, because I, I think I started as a lawyer at 22, I was um, running a weekly meeting uh, composed of uh, a whole bunch of former senators and congressmen and, and very well-known people, including David Rubenstein, who started the Carlisle Group, Ron Brown, who, who uh, tragically died as Secretary of Commerce. And every week I'd be running this meeting of people advocating for technology, fighting the most powerful lobby in Washington, which was the motion picture industry. And they thought they'd kill us. And they were, they were pretty arrogant. We were like 
like this room, like this section of the bar, like America itself. We were the most diverse group of people. Everyone had a strong view. And um, we, got, we had the best arguments. We were on the side of innovation and technology and letting the marketplace work. And we went to the Supreme Court twice. I coordinated the Niki. I was debating everywhere, testifying in Congress on the Today Show, live uh, at 27, debating these issues. And we ended up winning in the Supreme Court. First, it was a 4-4 tie. One of the, the justices apparently recused themselves, and then they decided maybe they shouldn't. Um, and we won by 5-4. That decision, Sonny Betamax in 1985, became the Magna Carta, if you will, the, the standard by which innovation is measured. And, and it's just the court held, if there are significant non-infringing uses, a product, whether it's a copying machine, a VCR, the internet itself, is legal. And that's allowed us as a world, frankly, and definitely as a nation, to proceed with this incredible growth in innovation and technology, which has brought extreme equality and raised the world in so many different ways. So the poorest person today who can afford a telephone that's connected is a lot richer in terms of access, communication, knowledge, able to get anything compared to the wealthiest person just a couple of generations ago. So that led my path, it's been a passion for me is focusing on innovation. And it hasn't ended, you know, this, where we are just since November with ChatGPT. You know, I watch CNN and I scratch my head and I, I hear people saying it should be illegal, how bad it is. There's, I see very smart people whose, some of their names were actually legitimately put on by them, some names were made up, on a letter saying let's halt everything for six months. And you know, so we're, we're still out there, in a sense, fighting, if you will, for the freedom to innovate and to make the world better because and you know, we've talked about this, I'm passionate that the technology and what we're doing today is going to solve the world's biggest problems. You can take almost any problem except perhaps potential war and, and talk about technology. You talk about um, what we're doing with food. Technology is, is making us smarter. We saw at CES John Deere showing how they're saving water and seed and fertilizer and having greater productivity with self-driving tractors that are micro-targeting where they plant their seeds. Or you see it with water, where the chairman of our board actually has a uh, product, uh, an African-American PhD in material science, a serial entrepreneur, he's running Bill Gates as one of his funds, as well as his own uh, venture companies. The product actually was introduced five years ago at CES, today it's deployed around the world. It takes water out of air, and he demonstrated it in the Las Vegas desert using solar power and you get potable water that people can drink. What could be better than that? You know, when so many people don't have water. I was just this morning at the UN um, at a session with a couple of my colleagues here focused on uh, India and what they've done with uh, the ability to raise up the level of almost their entire population at this point to have some level of financial equality by creating a software system and telephone system which is free that allows people to have financial access. So, I mean, Technology is, is like, the, to me, the coolest thing in the world. I mean, you could talk about trees or things like that that I love also, but I get excited about innovation. Now, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I came here with one goal, folks. It was to get an answer in. That was it. <laughs> we'll go deeper into that answer because We'll conclude this with your recommendations about what we can do to protect the innovative process. And if, if, if that was all you were about, I wouldn't have invited you. Because I think there's a lot of innovations that haven't proved to be quite as, as uh, productive and useful as they could be. I'm a, I'm a fellow in the World Academy of Arts and Science, which was created by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell when they realized, as Albert Einstein said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything except our mode of thinking and we drift toward catastrophe, because he understood that that technology could provide the wherewithal to end all technology and all people. And, so, and thus, technology is any human endeavor, anything we do has to be practical, useful, and pass the test of what's morally good and useful. So that's splitting the atom, which is probably the best argument you could use, is, isn't that the same thing as nuclear energy that's powering most of France? As he said, we have to, we ha it should change our thinking, it means we have to evaluate the different uses. The use of nuclear weapons is quite morally distinguishable from the use of producing energy. And in fact, 
we've gone from over 65,000 nuclear bombs to less than 14,000, and much of those bombs that were, uh, were, were, were retired were provided the wherewithal for nuclear energy in the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. With so Russia. I am not going to sit up here and debate nuclear arms reduction with you, and I want to thank you for all the great work you've done. But I'm going to, can we just play a game? Apps on the game. So this is the game I want to play. I am going to give you a series of inventions, and you could answer me good or bad or yes or no. No nuance. No, no nuance is allowed. Oh, I know this will kill you. Okay. Um, fire. Taming of fire by humans. Good. You know, fire has killed millions of people. Um, so does marriage. The wheel. Well, I'm not going near that one. The wheel. <laughs> Good. Well, wheels are used in war, and that's how you get superiority. <laughs> um, how about the axe? Good. And we all know about axe murderers, but who knows about, like, what... Who, who does good stuff with axes? So, uh, should I keep going? I could go to the printing press, I could go to the electricity, telegram, oh, the, okay, I, I the gotta, I'm not even in the 20th century yet. I got a better one. What if we ask Mother Nature whether the human inventor has been a benefit to the biological systems of the planet or not? It depends how you want to evaluate them. If you could just go for diversity, probably not. But if you go, look, as someone once, very smart once told me, humans are the only people that can, the only species on the earth that can imagine the future. And that's what I quoted yesterday. Well, <laughs> someone very really smart. So I guess the point is, uh, getting back to technology, whether it's the, um, the airplane, the car, the train, the uh, computer, radio, television, telephone, internet, I'm not there yet, I'll get there. Uh, but all these technologies, Putting aside for one second things which we, which can be used in wartime, starting with gunpowder, nuclear guns. If you look at it, the role of government government has a role. And but on the other hand, if we had blocked all these technologies, like and this is the battle I have fought, and I actually used this in a filing last night. Um, the buggy whip manufacturers tried to stop the advent of the car. Yep. They worked very hard to lobby against it. And you know, I, I know there's a lot of people from many different countries uh, here, but what I like about the United States is, is that people come, industries do that. That's what I fight these industries. I'm fighting broadcasters now. They're trying to mandate AM radio in every car because no one listens to AM anymore. It's very expensive. If you have AM radio in a car, you can't get a lot of other stuff because it has a huge amount of spectral interference. And obviously, you know, the free marketplace is determined that AM radio is just not very usable by people. So but I'm fighting broadcasters over this issue. And I've been fighting industries that all they try to do is protect their, what they think, and they're usually wrong about their own interests. I fought Jack Maloney one-on-one -on -one all the time with the Motion Picture Association. We swore that VCR would be the death knell of Hollywood. And I said, that will make you more money than you've ever had as an industry. And, and I, history has proved me correct, whether it was video rentals or it was ability, the fact that you could take all your existing movie base and, and repurpose it and redo it. So you could take all these different inventions and you could say they should be just allowed without any regulation, or you could say government should create guard roles which govern their use. It's not the technology which is bad. Technology is just a tool. It's how you use technology. And if use of the technology is so inherently dangerous, then in certain ways that technology should be made and kept illegal. But at this point, the only technologies in the United States which are considered to be regulated and fully legal outside of like chemical and biological stuff, I'm talking about technologies, are um, those connected with certain types of guns, nuclear, and believe it or not, the ones, only ones I can come up with are radar detectors in a couple of states, uh, black boxes and cable which steal cable signals, and telephone scanners which uh, steal your privacy if you're on a phone call. Um, if someone has any evidence, please come up to me afterwards because I'm still trying to figure this one out. But, that, but the point is, is that we have developed, and especially the United States more than any other country, we have been as a society and economically, the fact that there's been this explosion of in innovation which has benefited and uplifted the entire world. And if we had listened to lobbyists for various industries, we wouldn't be there. We'd still be driving around on horses with carriages. You know, because a lot of people don't like cars or polluting. A lot of people didn't like the internet. You can access porn. You could do all sorts of things that, but this goes back in history. You could do a lot of those things. It was just more difficult to do. This just makes it easier. And so I said with ChatGPT, now people are saying it should be illegal. 
Like, really? Why should it be illegal? You know, there's one soft argument. It puts a lot of people out of jobs. Well, that could be true, but that's been true about every successful technology in history. You know, even if it's the wheel, they put a lot of people who, who did things, you know, otherwise. I, I mentioned the, the buggy whip manufacturer, but obviously every new development pushes people in a different direction, but it makes us better. And one of the ways of measuring that is how long do we live? If you lived, let's say, knowing your own personal health history, your family, if you lived 200 years ago, would you be alive today? Or you would have died earlier than you sit around this table? I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have made it this far with that. It's not only modern medicine, it's just what we know now. We're, we're taller, we're, we're stronger, we're physically better. We could transfer information to our children. We could find anything by asking a little piece of electronics or a question. Soon we'll have self-driving cars. Which will, there's 35,000 people that die every year in the United States, a million globally, from car accidents. 95% of those are human error and entirely avoidable. <coughs> and am I allowed to say something about lawyers? Absolutely. And the US is falling behind. And why is that? And I know this isn't the section I should be talking to. Trial lawyers have managed to stop legislation in Congress because they're going to lose their ability to sue and make a lot of money off death and injury. So they've stopped legislation in its tracks, which would allow us to have a federal law saying you don't have to have a steering wheel, you don't have to have all these things, you don't have the human person driving in a car. And now every state is making their own laws, but they've managed to you know, block it up in Congress. So that's my job and what I do, and it's what I write about. I've written several hundred articles, and there may be another book coming shortly which talks about some of these things. Uh, but the bottom line of it is, is that since I've raised lawyers. Um, I actually, I met a number of you ahead of time, but I do want to talk about M&A law. Your blanket accolades of technology per se obviously is qualified by the Chemical Weapons Convention that bars chemical weapons. And the Chemical Manufacturers Association was absolutely instrumental in creating that firewall between what they consider to be immoral weapons. Uh, the Biological Weapons Convention that Richard Nixon brought us considered that the plague and polio and smallpox should not be used as, as weapons and technology, biotechnology that could, could create those things. And the reason that I have so much respect for you, Gary, knowing your passionate advocacy for, uh, for the innovative capacity of free market capitalism unregulated to generate innovation that's a benefit to us all, is that at the last CTA, CES, the CTA run CES, this huge conference in Las Vegas, your opening speech highlighted the focus of technology to address human security. And then you walked the talk by highlighting technologies that addressed certain human security needs. John Deere being one of the examples, that John Deere was going electric, John Deere was having more, more rational uses of pesticides. But it went through, they went through a series of, of things involving healthcare, environmental protection, uh, all of the key uses that technology can be used for when it has that extra thought about it. How can we improve human life? And you highlighted and uh, and, and I see what the next one is going to highlight values again. So that's why I, that's why, although your advocacy sounds crass, the way you work has the subtlety. <laughs> well, first of all, Jonathan, and you said that I, unregulated, I, what I was trying to say is that the role of government is to put up reasonable guardrails so companies know what is legal and what is not legal when they're using things. And, and we've been very good partners in government in doing that in a range of products. We're also talking about those products were illegal before. Um, and so it's just not the free market. Uh, everyone even who believes in the free market believes there's a role for government, whether it's to enforce contracts or to do something. I, I'm in the middle. I'm perfectly happy saying, regulate us. But what you shouldn't be doing is going to the government for permission to do things. That'll choke innovation. Um, and what you shouldn't be doing as the uh, Federal Trade Commission, in terms of merger and acquisition review is doing today, is throwing out standards of a bipartisan agency has had for 40 years of what's best for consumers and saying what's best to protect existing competitors 
and starting to ban virtually every large company from acquiring any smaller company. Not only is it bad for society and development, it's bad for startups. It's bad for raising capital and funding. And that's why we do advocate. In terms of, you want to talk about the nice things I'm doing. She's trying to say that there's a nicer side to Gary. Is, is how passionate the technology does good. And, and a lot of the, as I said earlier, the problem. So the Academy of um, Art and Science has, or is it science and art? World Academy of Arts and Science. And okay, close one, one of its leaders, Walt Stimson, is yeah. a fellow in it. Thank you. So it is, along with the UN, they've identified these fundamental securities. I call them human rights. You have a right to clean air. You have a right to clean water. You have a right to health care. You have a right to food. You have a right to community involvement. You even have a right to political choice. And th those are the kind of things that excite me a lot because I think that's where we're going as a world. We have to agree on these, some of these basic things. And walking around the halls of the UN this morning, I, you know, that's basically on some of the walls. And that underlines some of the, the, the basic principles of the UN and the sustainability. And that's what we're talking about. Only, I'm, I'm good with that, that Only last year was the, did the General Assembly recognize the human right to a clean and sustainable environment. And under our civil rights laws, uh, the right to a clean and sustainable environment does not exist. So our civil rights, we don't have a civil or human right under our laws yet to a clean and sustainable environment. I was on the uh, board of the Public Interest Law Corporation in Philadelphia, and we did a suit against the state of Pennsylvania when they tried to put a waste disposal facility in Chester, Pennsylvania, using the civil rights law, saying that this was going to injure a, uh, uh, it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was going to injure the black population of Chester, Pennsylvania, and we claimed that they had a human right, a civil right to a clean environment, although actually we knew uh, that was a question of a legal argument, but as a political argument, uh, we won. They didn't put the waste disposal facility because it would have been very difficult for the state to publicly argue that the people don't have a right to a clean environment. So your, your advocacy on these global issues is extremely important because one of the things that blew my mind at the, uh, at the CES there was the extent. I, when I flew there, I was on a plane with a bunch of, uh, with a lot of Hasidic Jews. And when I got there, I saw them two days later handling, that's a Yiddish term for negotiating, with a bunch of Chinese manufacturers. And it was just, it was fantastic to see this huge cross-cultural diversity, this huge conversation taking place with people from literally all over the world, and seeing their common interest in innovation, in creativity, and respect for one another. And that is the world I know we have to live in because science and technology are either going to protect the oceans, which is 50 to 70 percent of our oxygen, or it's going to destroy them. And we're not going to get to the point where we have the less necessary cooperation unless we have more people like you promoting that kind of civilized dialogue. And trade and technology are the cutting edge of that. So I want to I want to ask you straight up what are the what are your recommendations of what this audience of distinguished attorneys, activists, influence leaders, and articulate and passionate advocates, what can we do to protect the values that you are espousing? Well, the reason I was really happy to speak to this group is because I have tremendous respect for what you do. Um, I I have been a free trade advocate my entire career and uh, traveled the world. And I believe strongly that if you're trading together, you're less likely to be fighting with each other. And I'm also a big believer in the rule of law, um, which I think is really important. I know you focus on that in a sense a lot more than I do globally. I am concerned about the, the breakdown of the WTO and the fact that the United States has yet to even allow it to have appeals go up because there's just not enough, there's not, we have not appointed judges and we've pulled back and we're doing a lot of things inconsistent with the clear rule of law, the WTO, the US is losing cases because of that. So I, I would urge each of you to stand up vocally and talk about the value of trade, the value of the face-to-face -face relationships. I mean, the truth is during COVID, as we tried to do, all of us, we tried meeting 
via computer. And as much as I am the paid cheerleader for the consumer technology industry, and you're using all my products, uh, our industry's products, it's, uh, it's not the same as being face-to-face. Because face-to-face, not only do you establish real, meaningful relationships and have that five-sense experience of being together, but there's also a lot of serendipity involved. You, you get to meet other people you haven't met before, and again, you establish relationships. That's why we have the CES as a trade show. Um, we tried really hard to have an amazing digital event, and we got some great awards for being, doing it right, but it really, the left, it's very, it's like eating McDonald's. You do it, they don't feel that great afterwards, because what did you really do? Um, something that probably wasn't that fulfilling. So in terms of what you do as, as lawyers, and many of you involved in international trade, I think it's really important, but most people don't understand what you do. Most people, my whole career, I've had to fight in Washington for the concept of free trade. I was recollecting one of my career foolish things, which I, turned out to be okay, was I challenged Lou Dobbs to a debate on live CNN on trade. And you could Google it if you want, you could find it, you could figure out if I won or lost. But it, it was risky, but I, was, I'm, I am and was so passionate about the importance of it, and I felt it was horrible uh, the way he was very mercantilist. He tried to be a populist. He hid the fact that he actually has a degree from Harvard with, in economics, and I called him out on TV. He was pretty angry at me for that because he thought he was going to be president of the United States. But, but the bottom line of it is, is what you can do uh, is important to speak more about it. We've tried every technique possible. We, we created a trade bus that went around the US. We started here with Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, um, who welcomed us. And we went around. We had Republicans. We had some Democrats. But it's always been the close votes on all the free trade agreements that we pushed. Um, and we, we still advocate for free trade agreements. Uh, we couldn't understand how both the Democrat and Republican candidates for president were running away from the one deal that actually took on China with a, the, you know, the Pacific free, free trade agreement. It's just unbelievable. Um, so the level of knowledge in the public discourse about trade is almost non-existent. You know, there are members of Congress who would cut off trade with everyone, including our allies, uh, overnight. And that's, that's the other disturbing trend that I think people should talk, talk about. And that is that the United States itself, Republicans and Democrats, are starting to put things in not only which, which hurt trade with those that are not our friends, but they go after our friends. You know, what's in this great environmental solar energy bill is, is let's you know, require everything to be made in the US, which is frankly insane, will raise costs. Uh, we're not that good at it. It would take 30 or 40 years to get to the point where we're self-sufficient. But we have great friends. When I've gone around the world, and I've met with some national leaders and been in a lot of meetings, my advocacy is, look, the Western world, and I assume most of you are the Western world in one way or the other, um, are, for the most part, if you put Russia aside, um, are democracies that believe in the liberty and the focus and rights of individual people. And we are at a turning point in the world where we have a battle for influence between those that think the group is better, like in China where everyone is socially ranked and everything is, is um, you do on social media is monitored and scored and whether you jaywalk or pay your bills on time determines upon where you're ranked on a dating site or what hotel room you can get or even if you can get a hotel room and travel. It's, you, know, you do that to 1.3 billion people. They're all ranked at this point in time. And do we want to go in that direction where there's no freedom of religion, no freedom of who you marry or marriage or how you treat LGBTQ or, or anything else that we've come to accept in the more, I don't want to say civilized world, because they're kind of civilized too. And so we have to figure out you know, what side we're on. And I think we're on the side of uh, you know, the European countries and a lot of South American, Central American countries, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and others. And we have to agree, we gotta to work together, we gotta to share knowledge, and we should have one big free trade zone. Um, and that's, that's where I am. So what you can do, is if you believe in something strong enough, you have to stand up and fight for it. You can write, it's not difficult. You write letters to the editor, you, you comment on boards, you do things, you're very bright, all of you. You write articles, people respect you. You're the leaders in each of your fields and in your, some of your countries. And you can't be passive in life because it, you know, life goes to those, and it, to those who stand up and say something. Everyone else is quiet. It, it, you're not gonna change the world. You can stop a lot of bad things from happening. The issue, the issue of the fundamental freedom of the individual is the corrective of government overreach. The corrective of that we, in our system, 
as all systems, mistakes will be made. But when the moral agency is in the handful of people, then there's no corrective because there's no ability to criticize. So I think that it is both practical and moral to protect the fundamental freedoms that we have. Yes, and as we are a nation of laws, which is why I think focusing on that, educating people about that, and that's why when things like January 6th happen or something like that, it, it does cross a line. Uh, which is, goes beyond mere advocacy and, and the right to litigate versus the right to basically not allow the peaceful transition of power, which we've had for forever. Well, as long as the U.S. has been around. And that's, that's what we're about. I'd like to open it up for some questions. Please come up so, because we're videoing it, and, uh, and identify yourself, because we want to share this with people afterwards, uh, especially what Gary just said, because this is important. Hi, thank you very much for being here. Caitlin Hayes, Attorney Hayes, an alum of Cravat as a legal assistant too. Shout out, thank you for hosting. I do think that they did a great job in hiring you. You were fabulous lobbyists. They you have really hit the chord of what the move is. But I do would be remiss to not identify the actual fallacies of the argument. Firstly being the cobalt industry in Congo. Is everybody aware of what's been happening with the technology companies? Depleting resources? denying individuation in Congo, and also not to mention the surveillance and the 5G and the future lawsuits that we will find ourselves advocating on behalf of our minor children who will have now brain cancer and tumors from the phone on their ears, just like the cigarette companies did years ago. So I'd like to mention that glossing over, it, it kind of creates a resumption of guilt from my perspective. We can't discuss sustainability when we're still violating all of those rules. So to get free trade, to exploit countries and peoples is not what I stand for. And I hope from the bottom of my heart, not what all of you stand for as well. So I've been developing my practice area in Africa. And we need to be understanding that these resources are not finite. We have to be able to understand that there has to be a push and a pull. And seeking the technology without understanding the AI awareness is remiss of responsibility at this point. So I wanted you to speak about the surveillance and the free zone, the free trade regarding the human, the human resources as it, as it affects the slave um, mining and also the free trade with regard to the resources in order to manufacture these products. Uh, you've raised a lot of issues. Um, I'll start with one. There's zero evidence that using a cell phone near your head has any harm at all. There's been about a zillion studies about that. As to cobalt, I'll, I'll confess I know very little about it, but I do know that, for example, there are competing goals sometimes in life. One of the is our nation, especially uh, the, the president, uh, has made a decision that environmental sustainability trumps a lot of different things. So we are rushing to electrification of cars and things like that as if the electricity for cars comes from nothing. It actually comes from batteries. The batteries use a lot of things. I don't know about the specifics of what you're talking about, but I do know a lot of the, the rare earth and the uh, precious, um, uh, the compounds that go in them are coming exclusively from China and Russia, uh, like lithium, which is actually in Chile as well, but um, yes, you're like the number three producer right, so of lithium in the world. Uh, and definitely the environmental impact of that is, is real and you have to deal with that. Uh, and we are, we are rushing to things perhaps we shouldn't be rushing to. Yes, please. Uh, we, went, we went to high school together, full disclosure. <laughs> Not pretty agreed. Uh, my name is Bill Pierce and I'm uh, also uh, uh, the one who was criticized by Lou Dobbs in his book on outsourcing because I have been a long time uh, supporter and promoter and contract negotiator of outsourcing uh, of offshore services. And so what I would like to ask you is, what's the deal with, quote, friendshoring versus outshoring, offshoring? Lou is against offshoring anything, so in that sense, he's the MAGA guy. Uh, and now we're talking about friendshoring, which is proposing a trade with friendly countries and, and then not talking about the rest. Thank you. Exactly. That's what I, um, friend sourcing is sticking with your friends. And, and it's not only the, the sourcing of, of products, 
It's also the sharing of research and development information, collaboration, joint efforts. And, and I, I, we had a, things that a lot of people wore at CES, it was BFF, little bands around your wrist. So yeah, it's obviously friend sourcing. There's a lot of different words that people are using. It's not the most popular view in Washington right now. I think there's a strong view of sourcing everything in the United States, which violates you know, basic economics, law of comparative advantage, everything else most of us were kind of raised with. It, it, if we do that, think about how that will increase the divide between the haves and has nots, because things will become so expensive. It would be, I mean, I, you know, a smartphone that could cost a few hundred dollars would be several thousand dollars. It's just, we're, we have to think about the consequences. Just, just like I was talking about how we don't consider that electric cars use a lot of electricity, there's not the grid that's there, there's not the transmission lines, which cost a huge amount of money, and there are alternative fuel sources, but yet we rush ahead with these things. And it's like a groove thing. And, you, and, and the challenge is, frankly, when you start going down that road, you, you won't see the New York Times talk about this. You'll see the Wall Street Journal, maybe, but the Washington Post and New York Times, a lot of media won't even talk about the consequences of, and this is science-based consequences of what you're doing. But if you do, if you include your friends in the group and you, and you do, you know, you are balanced, you consider nuclear energy, you consider obviously solar and wind and geothermal, do all the, you have a better chance of moving forward. And, you know, but now we're in a position, it's a difficult position to be in, where all the solar panels are pretty much made in China and they're very cheap. And a lot of those technologies aren't here. We have gotten ourselves into a difficult position as a world by relying as the world on the, on the manufacturers. And I've been in China, so I've been going to China for years. We had events there, I had an office there and a staff there. Uh, I closed it down pre-COVID, which is, I'm pretty thrilled that I did, uh, for multiple reasons. But one of them um, has to do with, I just felt that the direction they're going under President Xi is so, frankly, dangerous for our own staff, dangerous for me. I'm not going back to China in my lifetime, given the things I've said. Um, that we, we really have to stand up for what we believe in. And, and since others of our friends believe in that, why should the U.S. go it alone? I mean, I'm going to switch subjects really quickly if I can. So the irony about what's gone on with Russia and, uh, and um, the, the invasion of Ukraine is that it didn't accomplish what Russia wanted. It accomplished the reverse. It shoved Europe together when it was falling apart, increased their defense spending. They got people now in NATO they didn't even expect to get because you know what, what makes you, what puts you in common with each other are the fact that you have a common enemy. You know, the U.S. You know, five years ago was questioned whether we should be in NATO. I mean, so there's, it's everything that Russia planned has gone wrong on this. So we've got to stick with our friends. Whether and we have to stick with them even in when we don't need them. That's what being a friend is. One of my books, I think it might be this one. I talk about. I give a lot of personal advice. So one of the best things, if you're a real friend, you're not kowtowing to someone when they're they're very successful. You you call them when they lost their job or when something bad happens. And that's what we should be doing as well as countries. Great example of Russia's mistake. The people in Russia can't speak out to correct it. I would say we made a mistake uh, in Vietnam. I would say we made a mistake in our invasion of Iraq. But the difference is we can criticize our government and make a correction. That, that tells everything. Um, I, I, I recall a conversation I had with with, uh, with Secretary George Shultz told me about a conversation he had with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan called him into his office and said, I'm getting alarmist criticisms about the dangers to the ozone layer. And I'm not a scientist, I don't know, but if they say that if we don't do something about it, it's going to adversely impact agriculture, cancer rates, many other things, and therefore, it would make sense to have an insurance policy. Out of that came the Montreal Protocol. 155 nations have joined it, and we have indeed protected the ozone. But Schultz went further. Can I, can I, uh, let, me just, let me just finish. Right. Schultz went further and said, Reagan called him back in and said, um, uh, we, we want to do this with the least amount of regulation possible and the most beneficial way of producing industries and wealth, and at the same time protect the environment. And I think that was a wise course. It has proven successful. And we actually, because of that treaty, have protected the ozone layer. And I think that's a model. So I want to give my little piece of history on this, because I don't think anyone in the room knows this, including my colleague who's working with me on my book. Uh, 
when that happened, and I don't doubt anything you said, uh, I was a general counsel of a parent organization, all electronic companies, and we had to deal with it. And we created something, and I actually did the legal work on it, the uh, committee, something about the ozone layer. It was, yeah. And we got together, and we, we all shared best practices as manufacturers around the world yeah. about how you, what you could do to substitute for, for the ozone depleting chemicals. And the funny thing was, in the electronics industry, and you're making circuit boards and all this other stuff, it was water. It was high-speed water. And uh, it worked, and, it be, and, and we cut down, I don't think that the electronics industry uses those under the and hasn't used it forever, and the hole has like kind of disappeared. Um, yeah, that's an example of- I Didn't know that about me, huh? No, I didn't, and, and that's consistent with my evaluation that you know, you've got deep values and that the free market can be used to generate wealth and provide protecting the environment. And uh, it's also interesting that the uh, that the Clean Water Act was was initiated by a Republican as well. It was initiated by Ronald Reagan, environmental. I mean, uh, Richard Nixon, the Environmental Protection Agency. Richard Nixon. Right now, our debate. You're a Nixon fan. Wow. Yeah. See, one of those in a long time. And Ronald Reagan. It's interesting. Uh, what's so horrible now is that our debate has become so like ad hominem attacks without any reasoning, and without and has become partisan toxicity rather than the use of our liberties and freedoms and dissent and disagreements for the common good. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to speak out about, that, that rational debate and uh, part bipartisanship in addressing issues and debating what's the best way forward is in itself an extremely existential value for improving our conduct. And I want to thank you, Gary, for, uh, for, for being a strong advocate for free market innovative capitalism, but also, also bringing values into that equation. And, if you, and I'm going to end and let you have the final word, which I only do for my wife. <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to add something. Um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts I'd love to share. But you did mention this thing. I, I haven't talked about that ODC thing in a, in a long time. But it's like my view of uh, being a CEO is there are two types of people in the world. There are people who talk a lot and there are people who do a lot. And often they don't overlap. And I'll give an example that we haven't talked about. There's a lot. Um, involving uh, Black Lives Matter and diversity and inclusion and equity, and you don't hear too much from my organization on that, because we just do it, and we're doing stuff. I've had diversity as a requirement for my board of directors in the nomination form, uh, a scorable, we score on a 100 point scale, all candidates, and diversity has been on there for 20 years, and we have, uh, we have more women and minorities in our board and our staff and everything else. And we created a $10 million fund where we actually give money to, because we think there's not enough, because people give money to people who look like them. Uh, we give money to uh, funds that invest in uh, minority owned and women owned or led firms. So they, they can have a chance of getting, at the very beginning, uh, have that startup. And that's why we push things like apprenticeship programs, we do all sorts of things because the fact, my I am passionate, especially if you read my first book, when I talk about the comeback, how innovation will restore the American dream, the strength of the United States, and I respect the fact that a lot of other people in countries here, is we are the most diverse country in the world. And diversity is really important to innovation. It's important because that if you get people in a room from different backgrounds, different cultures, they're more likely to come up with something innovative. And that's just a fact. And that's who we are. And plus we have this great thing called the United States Constitution, which allows us to challenge status quo industries. It allows us to, and we're in large part an immigrant country. And the immigrants, you know, they're disproportionately represented in the technology industry starting companies. So when I hear about people cutting down on immigration, it just drives me crazy. Not, obviously we have immigration issues and we can debate them in another round, but we need more people here. And I'll give you one final example, which isn't apropos of anything, but it really concerns me because we are an aging population, and Congress has limited the number of doctors which can be trained in US uh, schools to a flat rate going back a couple of decades. So we have 
a limited number of doctors being trained. A lot of them are actually leaving the profession because of either malpractice costs, especially in the OBGYN area, or because of a lot of other reasons. And we do get some coming from abroad that helps. But the reality is we were living longer. There's more things to deal with. Med the, the pace of medical change is beyond rapid. Now, where we feel in as an industry is we, we supply the health technology, which allows us to deal with the, the, sort of the lack of doctors and healthcare professionals. And that's what you're seeing a lot of it. We do a lot of volunteer standards, a lot of things so we can get those products to market. And that's why a lot of people are measuring their sleep or their steps or their heart rate, and their diabetes, their, their blood without having to inject. And all sorts of things come in down the line. And that's it, CS. I want to invite every one of you to see yes. The fact that you're in a room means you will qualify to attend. You just go to our website. There's a lot of um, stuff that's focused on training. We got a lot of people from around the world attending, uh, cabinet ministerial level, heads of countries, things like that. A lot of members of Congress, they come there, and everyone who's ever gone there has a different view of innovation and technology and of trade, which is why it's important that we get policymakers there. And we do get over 100 uh, policymakers just about every show. Uh, President Macron is one of the biggest. He, he just loves CES. Um, for what it's done for French companies and French entrepreneurship, but I tell you, we're seeing a lot from South Korea, we're seeing a lot from uh, the Netherlands and, and elsewhere, and it's, it's just, there's no one owns innovation in the world, and there's a lot of entrepreneurs and technology is a lot of almost anyone to start a new company, and that's what we focus on. We run the show so that anyone with an idea can expose it to, you know, over 100,000 retailers, media, investors, and partners. So thank you for having me. What you're doing is really good. I think it's important for the world. And I appreciate it because trade will make the world better. Thank you.